Okay. Hello, this is Eddie. Today, I started out as a kid, making my own guitar and my, playing my grandmother's drums until I got this recording contract with Sussex Crickets and put out a couple of albums on that label with myself, Bill Withers, SOS, and quite a few others. And I had a hit in my first album, Hot Thing, that was number one in the city of Detroit, and it went worldwide, did very well. And then I did my second album, a film, a step-by-step album, out of which uh, the tune Cameo and Delgado seemed to be picking up some steam. And we're doing a reissue on these particular albums now, and it's like regenerating interest and um, bringing in a whole new fan base. And hopefully we'll do some wonderful things with the worldwide tour coming up. I was born in Alabama and uh, lived in uh, Macon, Georgia, where I got to uh, meet Sam Cooke and James Brown and uh, Little Richard. Used to go down to Little Richard's house and watch him perform and play Long Call Sally and all that other stuff on the upright piano. And his guitar player, Jazz Bo Brown, was the one that taught me how to play guitar. And at the time, I was like 12 years old. And I also played in the band in uh, Alabama when I was born from the age of 10 up until the age of 12. And I was so small that we had to get a little red wagon to pull the drums on so that I could play the drums in the parade band. And I played first chair at the age of 10 years old, playing first chair in the varsity uh, high school band, which was unheard of. But it was a talent because I uh, learned how to play the drums. I was always musically inclined. I, and, but I used to get my grandmother's pots and pans and go outside and beat them with the big old chili spoons. You guys remember those? And I used to beat holes in those pots and pans. But then as I uh, started the progress and learning classical music, as well as, you know, the marching music, and, and I, I just became exposed. And then I went to a music conservatory uh, at the age of uh, 13 and in Macon. Uh, I paid for my own first marching band drum, which was a Ludwig, and I worked there every Saturday, and I paid $2.50 every Saturday out of my paycheck pay for that uh, drum. The drum at the time cost $98. And it was, uh, it was quite a thing for me. But at age of 14, you know, 13, doing something like that was extraordinary. I moved to the Detroit area at the age of 14 and I stayed with the drums and I was already playing guitar and I uh, started playing with different bands at the age of 15 and 16 and practicing at the house. And my mother, she had a piano placed in the house. And, and we would, uh, every every weekend, we would have a jam session. So my first band that I actually joined was called the Mount Royal Clefts. And it was, uh, we used to practice right across the street from Northern High School, where I attended uh, in, in Detroit. One of my buddies that uh, actually played with me uh, with McKinley Jackson, uh, he played trombone, and he ended up becoming the music director for Marvin Gaye. And also the same school, Mel- uh, Melvin Franklin attended there from the Temptations, and quite a few other notables that uh, attended Northern High School. And one significant thing I remember is um, one, one, one evening we had finished rehearsing, and we were coming out of the recreation center there, and this street that we were on is called Woodward Avenue, the main street. We decided that we would have a parade, 9.30 at night. There were a bunch of kids, 15, 16, 17 years old. And McKinley had his trombone, and somebody had a flute, and Toki had the, the, the drums, pulling them on this wagon. Because he was, he was, you know, didn't have any cars at the time, young know, teenagers, you know. So we just we decided to march down Woodward Avenue and block and drive it, stop and drive it, and here comes the police. And <laughs> they take us to the police station, and the police sergeant, he says, hold up. He says, what's going on here? What, what, do you, what make you guys think you can have a parade in the middle of Woodward Avenue at 10 o'clock at night, you know? And he says, look, he says, if you can play a certain song for me. He said, I'll let you guys go. But if you can't play that song, I'm going to lock you up. So we 
said, what song is that? Now remember now, McKinley had this trombone, this slide trombone. And it, it, the sergeant says, cherry blossom, apple, cherry blossom, apple, or blossom white, or cherry white, apple, blossom white, or something, something like that. McKinley, he just took out his horn, he said, da 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 and the sergeant said, get out of here. So that same girl said, he just made that up. He knew the tune, but he had never played it before. But his talent was that, you know, that's the kind of people I grew up with. We all had that kind of talent. I could play the piano, and, and before you had any formal training, didn't know what notes were. I can tell you what a note is with my back turn. I can use you just hit the note. I'll tell you what the note is. It doesn't matter if it's sharp or flat. I, I played with a group called Aaron McCray. They made some tapes with me playing guitar with them. And they sent these tapes off to Sussex Records, where Bill Willis were, and uh, SOS, Ivan. They were all, you know, grouped up with the Buddha group at the time. And, um... The, the, the owner of, of Sussex, Mr. Clancy Run, he sent back worried that he was not interested in our band, but he was definitely interested in the guitar playing. Because the guitar player has got some kind of unique sound that he likes. So the band said, well, Eddie, it's your shot, man. I said, well, I thought we were going to be a group together. He said, no, nah, man. He said, they said, you got this shot. You only take it. So uh, the legendary Bill Williams, who was a... Uh, music director at a radio station in, in uh, Eastern Michigan outside of Detroit, WCA to be um, he was the one that had this company called Dorn Productions that asked him to uh, sign his contract with Sussex and he would produce it. And when when I uh, finished the first album, uh, his hot thing was a hit in the city of Detroit. It was announced by Johnny Simpson and uh, Gay Butler at WJLB uh, in the city of Detroit. And, and it was number one for several weeks. And then it started uh, getting into the top 100 in the, in the chart on Billboard. And, and, and it just started to just put you on like hot spot. So that's why we are like reissuing now these albums because it's, it's beautiful music, it's raw. I didn't want to overdress it. I just want to keep it nice, plain, and simple, and not run too many technical things. Not try to be too slick with it, just smooth and jazzy, like you know. Well, about my guitar, the guitar that I used when I first started was called a Hackstrom, which comes out of Sweden. And I, I got this guitar in Sweden. Uh, as a matter of fact, I liked it because it had like six different switches on it, and I could get uh, the type of sound that I wanted to get by moving those switches. And the strings were were handmade, specially made for me by a friend of mine. My strings were like a special gauge. And uh, then I came up with this idea of uh, uh, using fire on stage. So, you know, fire chief started saying, you can't do that anymore. But but it was like doing that tune, and all of a sudden the lights go out, and then the, the, the guitar looks like it's on fire. But there's real fire. I didn't fire my hashtag up. I actually had my, my, my uh, crew man, you know, he, he handed me another guitar that would be, you know, lit up with the fire and everything. I would play the guitar with my teeth. And that was what um, was extraordinary about my act at the time. Well, the third album was scheduled to happen. Uh, Quincy Jones was supposed to do my third album, but what happened was the record plant had been booked but someone did a double booking at the record plant where I was going to do the third album. And Quincy was going to actually produce that third album because Quincy and Clarence are very good friends. They're very close. And so that, that it didn't uh, happen because the receptionist at the record plant in California, in Los Angeles, she had double booked. And I think it was Tower Power that uh, had been booked in and they block off the time for a whole month during those days, you know, they, they have a studio under their control for an entire month. And they pay $200,000, $250,000 right there, you know, for the studio. So, okay, they block it off. So that's why it, it didn't happen. And after that, um, I moved to Europe. 
stuff like that. But I, I, I left the United States and stayed away from the United States for quite a while. And then when I came back, I just kind of just um, got into uh, producing a, a, a new sound, new music, and uh, experimenting with different stuff and, and coming up with different ideas, lyrical content, and, and working with other people and stuff like that. Then I got involved with uh, uh, politics a little bit because the mayor of the city of Detroit, I was working with him, Mr. Dennis Archer, and I became head of the chief advisory council for that, for the city there. And uh, so I had to do my little uh, community duty uh, to, to, for the people. And then after he didn't, he decided not to run after eight years. Then I, I, I was back into my studio and started to continue my uh, my venture into uh, new sounds and, and uh, new ideas and, and stuff like that. So now I'm I'm, I'm thankful to be uh, pulled back out into it by a modern harmonic. They're doing some things that simply uh, simply put is needed. They have the right idea. It's music that sold and music that had sold and people could feel it. When you put stuff on vinyl, you you can feel the, the bass response. You can feel each note. You can feel that rhythm and you can feel that beat. And when it's all digital, all well and good, it's just something you're going to just listen to. But when you want to feel it, it's got to be on that vinyl. 